My name is Sam Achilefu. I'm the last speaker for the day, so I have to be very brief. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to this wonderful group of, um, of people. Um, when I was coming back last night from DC, there was flight delays, minute after minute, then hours. I started wondering if I can make it back at all. Um, it would have been a good thing because Monica is here who could have given the talk more elegantly. So I want to thank uh, Ravi who has played a key role in, in pushing the Center for Multiple Myeloma Nanotherapy, um, guiding us towards clinical translation and how to move forward. And Monica Shokin, who you will see a lot of her work moving from basic science all the way to clinical translation down the line. Um, so we've been really grateful to have this caliber of uh, co-investigators on the program. Um, so I always like to start with this, um, uh, which was uh, really courtesy of Reed Omari, who is the chair of radiology at um, uh, Vanderbilt University. And I want to ask you, what do you think this guy is thinking at this time? This is a true quiz with points. <laughs> okay. What do you think is going through his mind? Anybody, just tell me what you think. It's late in the day. Surprised. He's surprised, yeah, that's a good one. Um, anybody else surprised? Okay. He's what? Oh, crap. <laughs> that's what we say also, yes. <laughs> Any other one? Oh, there you go. So this is what we live and die for as researchers. We work so hard every day. A lot of failures, a lot of mishaps, things don't go the way we expect it to go. And just somehow we keep up this hope that one day somebody will look like this. Somebody will be amazed that they've just found something unique. And this is this little Harold that's never had before death. And in 1974, for the first time, the cochlear implant that everybody wears today was put in his ears, and he had words for the first time. Can you imagine how he felt? And those that produced it, you know, they are behind the scenes, but that's their world. This is our world, to make a difference in the society we live in. Yes, the dollar sign may not be there. Thank God we are very far from the dollar sign. We work really in a place where we want to make a difference and really treat patients. And you know, for me, cancer research is, uh, uh, Greg did mention that um, we were doing science fiction kind of research. Uh, we, we worked on these cancer goggles that allow surgeons to wear it and they can visualize cancer in real time and removal. That's cool. I still remember the first time. We were having fun doing that, by the way. And, and we had this model that you can see the whole cancer stream through a video stream somewhat. And the surgeon said, oh, we don't like it. Uh, we want to see our patient and touch them. And we said, all right, we make the ones that you can see through, see your patient as the, at the same time visualize a cancer. Surgeons liked it, but the public didn't. They say they prefer the cool factor. <laughs> so, so this is the life of researchers, what we have to go through. My science fiction for multiple myeloma is different, though. It is something that I hope one day we get up, find something that you can drink in the morning, neutralize the microenvironment of tumors, and take something like Celebrex or aspirin, and the tumor is gone. It's a reality. It's something we hope we can get to one of these days. But until we get there, we have to deal with real issues. So cancer, as we know, most of the times the patient comes in, it's always at the late stages. Um, for those that are, if you use the word fortunate, they can undergo surgery. Um, they can be resected and take out the cancer and then remove it. Hopefully, it's not spread everywhere else. But for multiple myeloma and a lot of these blood cancers, it's something that's just everywhere. Surgery is not an option. How I wish that we can be able to find, ah, I can't even use this. I'm worse than you. <laughs> uh, 
So, so the goal is how we wish we can be able to identify the cancer as soon as possible so that we'll be able to then treat them at this stage where mutation and the number of mutations are very small. We know really that realistically only about 5 to 10 percent of cancer are hereditary. And there's a lot more that could be done that, uh, to prevent cancer, um, 90 to 95 percent that you can see based on different factors. And if we consider all those together, we ask the question, what can we do to prevent it? Um, so what's currently being done today are multiple folds. Uh, either you find a surgeon to cut it, if it can be cut and removed, or you find somebody to give radiation and remove it if it's amenable to that, or give you enough poison and hopefully that it will go and kill the cancer cells and leave the normal tissue intact. And so these are the paradigms that we have today uh, for treatment of cancer, which really um, uh, is a, uh, but the question is why can't we really cure cancer? You know, um, these cancer cells for researchers really can be viewed in, in these paradigms. One is they are very deceptive. They fit in very well within regular normal cells, and it's hard to figure them out, especially at the early stages. And so that creates a problem for us. We can see them easily. We cannot treat them selectively. And the intimidation, intimidation factor is one of the things that patients go through. Um, I still remember many years ago, if somebody has HIV and you are diagnosed with HIV, it was like a death sentence. The fear, the, the immune system that you heard about, everything is now in, in, in compromised and they succumb to the disease. Today, if you tell HIV patient, somebody you have HIV, okay, we deal with it. We know it can become a perennial disease and I don't have to die with it. But for cancer, that initial diagnosis really leads to a lot of uh, lowering of our body host defense system to the point that uh, we become even more susceptible to cancer down the line. They are very resourceful. Um, they take the best food in the house. Uh, they eat up the best things and they use it up and, and change the whole paradigm in such a way that um, uh, I used to think about cancer as a disease um, that really is so smart that it finds a way to evolve over time. And of course, we know that one of the problems is that you go into remission, but when will it come back? When will the relapse come back, uh, the cancer come back? And what still is they migrate, which is why many patients die down the line, metastasis. So here's the major difficulties we have that we think we hear about cancer, it's really a host of diseases. Um, for different patients, they may have multiple myeloma, but each patient is different. And you come to within the same patient, you are now beginning to see variation in the type of constituents or genetic mutations that make up the tumors. And you take biopsy on one side of the bone versus another side of the bone, you get different results. And the problem is that even if you go down and you go to a different part of the body, you get different types of cancer. Within the same tumor tissue, you start looking at the tumors and you say, okay, they are, they are beginning to look alike here, but then the shapes, the phenotypes, structures may be different. How can you be able to kill them effectively? And this is the challenge we face every day in designing drugs that will be able to come up and kill this. And that's why today you hear more about the combination drugs and all the approaches that require multi-dimensional uh, uh, multi therapies that you have. Because you may be able to remove a lot of these cancer cells, but then there are residual, residual ones that will not be amenable to that. And then you said you're in remission simply because we can't see it anymore. They are very few until they grow back up again and then start treatment down the line. So these are issues that are faced with that we have to consider in looking at drugs and designing new drugs that we can use uh, to treat multiple myeloma as well as different types of cancer. Um, so the goal of our center, we are fortunate to be one of the six um, centers um, of nanotherapeutic approaches in the US uh, funded by the Na National Cancer Institute to look at ways of treating cancer differently from what's regularly done today. Um, our, our center focuses 
exclusively on multiple myeloma. We chose multiple myeloma because we have the clinicians that are well-versed in the area, we have the patient population that are in need of therapy, and we have the researchers and scientists that really uh, focus on eradicating this disease down the line. And the questions we ask are multiple fold. Can, we remain, uh, can the patient remain in remission for the duration of their lives and hopefully die of something else than multiple myeloma? And can we minimize the side effects that of course, which is a major problem uh, uh, that you may have. I always tell people that curing cancer is not a problem. It's the easiest thing you can do. The question is, will the patient survive to know that? Okay. We can preserve the quality of life and how can we be able to make sure that the patient maintains their high quality of life after therapy? And is it possible to, uh, if we know the high risk population, can we be able to start preventing the onset of cancer? So we have a three-pronged approach we use in our program. We develop new materials that will be able to detect cancer as early as possible. We develop systems and devices or imaging tools that can help us visualize them. And then we look at new drugs or combination therapies delivered in a way that we can minimize the side effect down the line. For multiple myelomas, we have various points of intervention that we're interested in. First of all is that the MGUS that you've heard about today. Some of the patients are at high risk or subjects are at high risk to move on to multiple myeloma. Are there things we can do at this stage to start preventing that migration or, or translation from MGUS all the way to multiple myeloma? A lot of patients respond to first round of therapy. And at that stage, once they're in remission, what can we do to be able to maintain and prevent them from relapsing and going to the second round of therapy? So those are the key questions or approaches or points of intervention we're interested in doing. Um, we have three major programs anchored by imaging for the center. One of the projects uh, is looking at how to really inhibit um, uh, the driver, the genes that drive multiple myeloma proliferation down the line, CMIC. Uh, can we find a way to develop these new drugs and deliver them exclusively into this myeloma area uh, so that they can effectively be eradicated down the line? So this project is using non-drugs, new drugs, and combining them in a way to overcome the disease. Another project that we are looking at is looking, uh, asking a different question altogether. Can we use a photophysical method that's instead of using simply chemo, can we introduce a different type of therapy altogether where we use light to activate um, the cells and then make them more vulnerable to, to treatment or other types of therapies. And that's what this project is looking at. And the final one led by John DePostio is asking a different question. We have a lot of multiple biomarkers. Uh, are we able to find ones or a combination that will help us to detect as soon as possible the difference between the progression or the risk of moving from MGUS all the way to multiple myeloma? And can we be able to use that to enhance selective therapies down the line as we move forward? <clears throat> so imaging, as you heard, is a central role. And thank you, Jens, for that wonderful talk about how imaging is essential for us to understand what's going on in multiple myeloma. So I won't dwell on this further, because he's, he's really given us a, a good uh, uh, account of that. But we want to be able to stage the disease through imaging non-invasively if possible. We also want to be able to monitor treatment response. Is the patient responding or not? Is FDG the only thing we can use to do that? Or can we use other kinds of molecular imaging tools to answer those questions? And can we also predict when a patient is about to relapse so that intervention can be done as soon as possible? And also to assess uh, other kinds of complications down the line. So here is a good example where uh, you can see the imaging that is being used uh, with PET scan showing the patient with uh, a lot of lesions all over the body which can now be fused with the MR. So at Washington University, we now have the PET MR system that's available to be used to identify and diagnose and localize the disease more accurately down the line. So we're excited about this in radiology working with Ravi and, and, and his team 
to look at that. Meanwhile, we are asking different questions. So are there other markers that we can use to look at the functional status of multiple myeloma? And here is an example of one led by Molika Shokin, uh, who has developed a very small ligand that's labeled with copper 64 that we are now using to identify all types of multiple myeloma lesions at different stages. It's much better because it's highly selective. As you will see here, control, um, when you find all these lesions represent models of multiple myeloma, uh, which this agent now is able to pick them up wherever they are at different stages of development, including when they are spread to the spleen, which is one of the areas that this goes further to over the time. So this technology is now allowing us to be able to detect and be able to diagnose uh, multiple myeloma more accurately. And the FDA has just approved our IND to proceed with clinical trials. They will be doing that hopefully beginning of sometime this year uh, to pursue this and demonstrate that we have even a more accurate ways of complementing FDG that's currently used and you're applying this technology uh, for the uh, diagnosis of cancer. But even more interestingly for us is that we are going to be switching the radionuclide if we demonstrate success in human patients, switching it in a way that we can now use it for radionuclide therapy and maybe combining it with other therapies to have much better effect down the line. So in the case of the nanotechnologies, we are trying to address a variety of problems using that. Uh, one of which is that we, you've heard about the side effects of a lot of these drugs that are being given to the patients today. Uh, can we use nanotechnology to make sure that it's bioavailable? Infusion time can be reduced, and we can now be able to keep it in circulation over a period of time without going to the area that we do not want it to go. Can we modulate the release and also be able to target specifically to the areas of interest? More importantly for us is the combination therapy you've been hearing about today. Combination therapy is you are administering multiple drugs to the same patient, either sequentially or at the same time. Uh, one of the key points here is that they all distribute differently in the body. I mean, some of them we clear faster, some of them we clear slower, and they have these kinetics that you cannot control once it's inside the body. Can we then be able to work with Ravi and Co, put all these materials into a confine that allows us to release them, determine based on how we want them to act at the patients? And that's one of the work we are beginning to, to do to, to uh, make sure that this is useful for patients down the line. So the nanoparticles with John Depostio's group, we've identified a lot of biomarkers that are very unique and upregulated in multiple myeloma cancer cells. And what we are now doing is to use a combination of that, be it for checkpoint blockade or for targeted therapies to be able to enhance selective effect within the tumor. So uh, all these are now going on in our program to be able to, to complete that down the line. Here is an example of work that is going on. Um, <clears throat> Greg Lanza and Kathy Weibacher published this uh, a few weeks ago in Cancer Research where there is this nanomaterial that really behaves like a virus. Um, it, it has the outer coating that looks for the target where the cancer cells are. It's looking for, in this case, alpha v beta 3 integrin, which is highly upregulated, induced by the bone to express more of this when there are cancer cells in the, middle, in the surrounding. And then once it goes through and finds the target, it fuses directly into the membrane and then into the cytosol of the cancer cells. And that allows us to take a lot of these drugs that we used to call undruggable targets, like the mixing here uh, genes, um, directly proteins to prevent dimerization inside here and then uh, inhibit tumor growth down the line. The reason we like this approach is that we can make sure then that by taking advantage of the selective targeting strategies we have, we can deliver a lot of payload, a combination of drugs into the tumor. It works in different parts of the body, bone metastasis, the spleen, and the liver, and we hope to push this further. The advantage being that we can repurpose already known drugs that may be side, they have serious side effect and make sure that we load them in and only release them in the targeted area of tumors. 
The other project that we are working on that's also moving towards human, tra human translation, hopefully next year, is what we call the radiation-induced treatment, where you are using radionuclides um, of um, very low um, toxicity, it's not um, high dose, um, similar to what's used for imaging. And the idea is that these radionuclides always give off light that we do not care, we do not see, we do not use, because um, it's very short path. The path length is so short that it doesn't travel far. But we want to take advantage of that to minimize effect outside the area we want to have. And the idea then is that if we take the multiple myeloma cells residing in the bone marrow, and you deliver a, a payload of this material, um, here we have a drug that's called titanosine, which is used, uh, you know, been tried in Europe in human patients, at a soft uh, uh, toxic dose. And then it binds and enters into the bone marrow. And then we deliver something like the FDG that's used to detect and diagnose this disease. And when the two come together within the same point, then you potentiate the effect and they become toxic by generating free radicals and many other events within that pocket. And, and this is really um, important because by doing it this way, the only place you will have toxic effect is within the tumor environment and not elsewhere, because elsewhere the two materials do not come together. And so that preserves other vital organs from undergoing damage. And here is an example uh, that we've shown that if you take an untreated mice that has multiple my that have mice that have multiple myeloma, we start seeing a lot of this coming up, which is what you will see in human patients that's relapsed or not uh, responding to treatment. And once we begin to treat with um, the CRIT, as we call it, it quickly allows us to subdue that growth, eradicate them. But if you look very carefully, you will find that some of the mice uh, has these pockets of non-responding cells. The good news is that they do not blow up and grow up overnight. The bad news is that they are there, and we don't know what's going to happen to them. So what we have done is to go back and take all this and ask why are they not responding. And it turns out, which is the major challenge we have, is that some of those clusters of, clusters of cells do not express the receptor we are targeting. And so we need a combination targeting strategies to be able to get almost all of them at the same time. And this is what's going on right now as we proceed with that. Um, we've also started looking at what we call the um, combination therapies. Again, um, again, this is uh, from the lab of uh, uh, Karim Azib, Azerb, who is looking at using uh, a known drug, Tazimib, and as well as titanosine or other treatment models he piloted this to ask a simple question, can we minimize the side effect of this drug alone before we start combining it with others? And, and, and interestingly, if you look at these mice that are treated with either the free drug or a combination, I mean, or the drugs in the nanoparticles that's been developed, uh, CD38 targeted in this case, uh, which can also be used as a therapeutic agents down the line, uh, we can see that the animal is completely healthy, the quality of life is maintained, while all the other ones start losing their hair and they start having some issues down the line. So for the same dose, same amount, we can now deliver them selectively while minimizing the side effect in other parts of the body. Finally, one area we are really interested in is in identifying patients that will respond to treatment. Um, as you heard, these drugs can be very expensive. Uh, will you spend a million dollars only to find out it didn't work? And we want to avoid that by identifying and selecting candidates that will respond to the therapy as early as possible. Uh, the CD38, uh, 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 the ratuzumab that is now in clinical trials, not all the patients are going to respond to it or are responding to it. Can we first of all use this imaging profile to identify those that will respond and spare all the ones that we not from undergoing the toxic side effect with no benefit at all. And that's what's happening here. Monica's team, again, have developed this antibody labeled with zirconium 89, and this is very important. Uh, antibodies circulate in our body for a very long time. They don't clear very fast. And you need something that can track it for that length of time. And using these agents now, 
we can be able not only to identify the patients, but also look at those that are responding to treatment or not down the line as we move forward. So translational ability, we are really fortunate here at Washington University. We now have tools to help us move further to, to translate things from bench to bedside so that it can come to the uh, patient's benefit down the line. I, I, I like to say this, this is a terrible job to do for any researcher because it's repetitive all the time, but these guys just find joy in doing it because of the outcome. They believe they are going to change lives through what they are doing. So at Washington University, you must have heard this earlier on, I missed the earlier talks. We have a network that supports what we are doing and help us move forward uh, to benefit the patients. We also have uh, outreach programs that we go around sharing our ideas with uh, 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 people here and everywhere, training young people to start asking the questions differently. Cancer may not be the disease of genetic mutation something is inducing the genes to start mutating. Can you find the answer to that? That's the challenge we are giving our students these days, to find the solution that can cure cancer as opposed to uh, sending them to remission down the line. My final slide here, I spread all the cost is coming up again. And we formed a team for this myeloma program that allows us to thank you very much to raise funds and support the program uh, cancer research down the line. So, if you want to join our team, we have those that can only ride five miles and those that can ride 100 miles. Everybody is welcome to join the course down the line. Thank you very much for your attention.